So as we continue to grind our way through Patagonia, the group has broken up into three or four different subgroups. Uh, Pablo hasn't been feeling well, so he took off on his own. Tiberio and Evan were going to run ahead and find us lodging. And Bill Hathaway, Fonzie, and myself headed south and took an alternate route. And uh, it's kind of interesting as the trip wraps up, we're down to approximately a week. And I think that some of the guys are just getting tired. The larger group this morning just simply wanted to make some miles and get to the hotel as fast as possible. And I'm not that kind. I, I, I want to suck the marrow from the bone, so to speak. I may never be back here again, so we're having a long ride day. In the process, we found a road called X-256, which is, without a doubt, one of the top, one of the top five backcountry roads I've ever been on. For the last 40 miles or so, we've had this incredible tapestry of ups and downs and along the lakeside, and rivers and waterfalls feeding in to that big lake over there. It kind of runs up and down along the edge of the lake, giving you some wonderful, wonderful vistas, and then it'll drop down along the edge of the water for a while, and then it climbs back up to give you some more vistas. Just wonderful. So, X-256. What's making today's ride also a little more interesting is the simple fact we're in the Roaring Forties. And the Roaring Forties uh, were a name given to the zone of latitude 40 to latitude 49 along the eastern seaboard of South America. Uh, the wind just howls down here. And uh, we were taking a break a few miles back. We had the bikes on the side stands and all of a sudden a gusty wind came along and tipped two of them over on the side stand side of the bike. Flipped them even though the side stand was down. Uh, that's caused some pretty severe buffeting as we ride along, but nonetheless, it's okay and it's incredibly cool down here. Cool is actually the operative word. It's down around 50 degrees and we got the heated vests going and, and uh, we're just grinding it out. The remote accommodations for the evening, an authentic and rustic Patagonian sheep ranch. Inside the kitchen, a traditional ranch meal with lamb cooked over an open fire. There's little chance that anyone will be going to bed hungry after a meal like this. Anglo-Argentinian relationships. In the morning, the winds are just as strong. They will stay that way for the rest of the trip. So I just had an interesting experience. I was doing about 50 miles an hour and I reached a point where I was running with the wind. And as I rode, my dust was blowing ahead of me, meaning at least, you know, the wind was going 55 or 60 even in the direction I was going. It was creepy to see the dust from my own wheels blowing forward with me uh, and outpacing me. Boy, all sorts of wind-related experiences today. This is going to exhaust me. There's no way I can ride hundreds of miles like this in a day. I will be exhausted after 10 miles of this. I stopped to take some pictures of this dust blowing down in this basin. While I was doing that, my motorcycle flipped completely over the kickstand. Behind me, Jim, Fonzie, and Bill, somewhere down the road. Whoa, come on, get back on that damn road! Jesus. Man, this could be a long day if, if this first gear. Look at Bill there. He's just got a he's got a leg out to try to stabilize himself. They estimate the silo. Whoa! The 
those side winds are somewhere between 60 and 70 miles an hour. The key to this kind of ride is to go a little bit slower because once the wind starts to push you, you know, it just pushes you right off the side and there's sand berms or gravel berms between the tracks here. I'm riding down the gravel road between these ridges of gravel, but when I hit, get hit by a gust of wind, it blows me into a gravel ridge. And then I lose traction and I start to slide further to the left. Oh. Woo! Yeah! One second I'm riding along, the next second I'm down. And now the challenge is going to be to see if I can pick up this mother in this wind, which I highly doubt I will be able to do that. Ah! Ah! Further down the road, a patch of oil reveals another mishap. Pablo's motorcycle fell over and punctured the valve cover. Fortunately, Pablo has the tools and knowledge to repair this. By the time the support van comes back to us, the team is ready to go. I gotta say, this is some pretty nasty weather to be riding in. My bike thermometer says 33.8 degrees, so it's just above freezing. Got all my gear on, my heated electrical vest, waterproof outerwear, riding gear insulated long underwear from yesterday's windy conditions to today's wet conditions every day is an adventure in weather down here in Patagonia. As we travel further south it's going to start getting colder. Towards the end of the trip we're only going to be 500 miles from Antarctica in the springtime so it's going to be cold. <laughs> oh what fun it is to ride in a one horse open sleigh. We're heading into Petito Moreno. It's one of the few non-receding glaciers in the world. It gets bigger every year. Petito Moreno is one of the most important attractions in Patagonia. The glacier is part of an ice field containing the world's third largest reserve of fresh water. The terminus is three miles wide and over 200 feet tall. Oh, this is fantastic. By the time the group leaves the park, the glacier is socked in once again, and they continue to get pummeled by the strong winds. As they approach the border back into Chile, it begins to snow. We are at the Argentina border, heading for Torres del Paine. It's snowing pretty good. It's like Christmas down here. We're definitely not in Colombia anymore. It's a little early in the season and there aren't many tourists here yet. The group is fortunate to find lodging before nightfall. We got into Chile, we in Torres del Paine, and we're a little early in the season. Not very many people have actually opened up. We came in and they said, we're closed. We're not open for another week. And so over the course of an hour, we convinced them that it would be not only in their economic best interest, but we were likable people that they had to let us in. I don't even know where we are, but we're here. Salud, salud, the adventure salud, salud. continues in so many ways. Endlessly. Yeah. Torres del Paine National Park is the pinnacle of what the expedition has come to see in Patagonia. It's one of the largest and most visited parks in Chile. It was established in 1959 and was designated a World Biosphere Reserve by UNESCO.
sweeping roller coaster roads bring the group to the first view of the famous pink granite towers. Although the team has anticipated this visit for a long time, the actual experience of riding in Torres del Paine is more than anyone could have imagined. We've seen these incredibly jagged mountains. There are uh, three towers that are very well known that were all shrouded in clouds when we arrived. I said, come on guys, let's, let's, let's use the force and move the clouds. And somehow magically, in a few minutes, the clouds were gone. The whole Patagonia experience has been more than I expected, by far, uh, exceeding my expectations for everything from beauty to fun riding to great food to just about everything. It's a pretty magical place to come. The final push takes Expedition 65 from Patagonia across the Straits of Magellan into Tierra del Fuego. This is a cold, windy, and desolate environment, and the struggle against nature is apparent everywhere. We're in Rio Grande, Argentina this morning, uh, getting ready to head to Ushuaia, and there's a monument over on the coast to the conflict between the Brits and the Argentines over the uh, Malvinas, as they're known, or the Falkland Islands. And um, we just wanted to see that and try to get a sense of the Argentine perspective. And while we were there, uh, this gentleman walks up and hands out some stickers. This fellow is a veteran of the conflict on the Argentine side. And he invited us down to their little homegrown museum, which is just sort of a memorial and storyline for the conflict from the Argentine side, which, uh, regardless of whose side you're on. In the U.S. we heard only really the British story. It's interesting to hear the story of a young man, 18 years old, who was forced to go do what his government wanted him to do. So it's kind of cool to have the chance to see that. I clearly remember when it started in 1982, but we were having totally different information of what really happened during the war. And that's very sad. It should never happen again. An interesting side of Expedition 65 is that we have Colin, who is a British, a British citizen, and we also have Pablo, who is an Argentine citizen, standing at the monument down uh, by the ocean. Pablo was trying to strangle him for the camera. It's all good. It's a pleasure to meet you. Well, the plan for today is once we leave the museum here, we're going to hook up with two, the, the remaining two stragglers, and then we're going to ride on down to Ushuaia. We've got about 100 miles to go, and uh, we'll be at the end of it all. The team has traveled 64 degrees of latitude since leaving Cartagena. Only one degree of latitude separates them from their goal of reaching Ushuaia, the southernmost city in the world. Well, it's three kilometers to the end of our journey, Ushuaia. The boys are beginning to get excited. Yeah! <laughs> we did it! We did it! It's over! Park your bike! <laughs> Take your <You're> too much. <laughs> well done, man. We did it. Thank you, team. Yeah. Good job. Well done. <laughs> We did it, man. We did it. We fucking did it. We are still alive. We cheated death yeah. yet again. <laughs> That's it's great. Not a good show. This is our 65th day. So Expedition 65 did 65 degrees in 65 days. Nice job, you guys. Very proud. Very proud. Oh, too big, too big. You're too tall. Okay. Now there's your goddamn coin. You got to keep it with you for the next two or three days. Because there may be another coin check. <laughs> and that's the story of Expedition 65. From the heat and humidity of Colombia to the cold and windy climate of southern Argentina, 
the Expedition 65 team has traveled almost 11,000 miles and had a blast doing it. There's still a few miles left to the end of the road and the famous sign marking the end of the Pan American Highway. From here, if you want to go further south, you'll have to walk and then take a boat. You could go all the way to Antarctica, which isn't that far away. This is it, the last picture and the final destination. Thanks for traveling with us and safe journeys wherever you ride.